Welcome everybody. I want to welcome you to the American Psychological Association's Society for Media Psychology and Technology Division 46 to our webinar series. And today we're very fortunate to have Karen Dill Shackelford present. Uh, Karen is a social psychologist whose expertise is on social factors related to everyday media use from video games to social networks, from selfies to TV and film dramas. Dr. Dill Shackelford's work reveals both the risk and the benefits of living in a media rich world. She's the author of How Fantasy Becomes Reality and co-author along with myself and a few of our other colleagues that are on today of Mad Men Unzipped. And she also is the editor of the Oxford Handbook Media Psychology. So Karen's going to be speaking to us today about the social psychology of fandom, TV and films, absorption as a psychological fitness exercise. And Karen, I'm going to let you take over now to describe further what you'll be talking about today. Thank you again. We really appreciate you making time for us today. My pleasure. Um, thanks for those who are on the call and for those who are listening to this later. Um, I'm going to get started momentarily, but uh, I am multitasking today as a psychologist and a mom. I've got my son here, so I'm going to introduce him to the APA world. This is my son, Jason Dill, age 15. <laughs> uh, hopefully he'll ask a question uh, as, as we get started. Okay, so um, just briefly, I want to thank Tanisha Singleton for making this a lovely graphic here. I want to talk today, as Jerry Lynn said, about um, how our absorption in narrative fandoms can actually lead to psychological benefits. And I think this is a really exciting area. And today, I would love it if people would um, jump in anywhere during the talk. I know I only have 30 minutes, but that's okay. I really would love to have a conversation about what you're thinking about any of these things, because I think this is an emerging um, literature and something that's just on the cusp of really exploding from my point of view. And I'm just really excited to hear other people's perspectives on this. So I wanted to uh, clarify that today I'm thinking about story fans and story fandom. Uh, it's kind of hard to get all these terms together. I'm really talking about television and uh, film fans. But those words aren't really great anymore, are they? Because we watch things that are videos on our phones. I actually think the term television, because it means viewing from a distance, would still apply to all of those things. But we tend to associate television with a television, a, a set, like when I was a child in the 70s, that it might have had wood cabinets and curtains on them, things like that, or today's flat screens. But television just means viewing from a distance. So really, uh, I'll just mostly use the term television fandom, but for that reason, but I'm talking about films, talking about big franchises, but I'm not talking about sports fans or today about music fans, although certainly there are psychological um, overlaps with those fandoms, but they're also different. So I'm gonna start with a quote from our field and graduate university colleagues, Jean-Pierre Isboots and Jason Oler. In the history of human experience, one of our most pervasive and enduring reference points is our need for story. Stories help us to understand ourselves in terms of who we are, what we need, and why we behave the way they do, with the way we do. So I'm gonna give you my social psych perspective on this, and uh, it's a very exciting time for me because I've had these two books just come out, one in November and one in uh, December. And as Jerry Lynn mentioned, the second one, Mad Men Unzipped, um, the, here are the four, uh, co-authors of this book. Yes, four people can write a book together and it can be fun. Um, so these are the four co-authors. In the research that I'm going to talk about today uh, that's collaborative, um, Cynthia Vinny, who's in the, um, the upper left of this photo, and Kristen hopper Loznicki, myself, and Jerry Lynn Hogg were the authors of Mad Men Unzipped, and also Lisa Swain and Don Grant, and probably some others that I'm forgetting, apologies, uh, pipe in if I've forgotten you, have been on some of these publications. So I want to mention that it's a group effort. So this is about television fandom, specifically stories. Um, a lot of the literature that I'm going to cite here as foundational is about written narrative, which I've always thought was sort of funny because of the great amount of audiovisual narrative that we have in our lives. Uh, last time I checked the uh, number of minutes that we spend per day with written um, of work of any kind is less than an hour where there's you know, 
40 plus hours a week of uh, audiovisual kinds of um, engagement. By the way, uh, this picture, I'm going to cite it at the end of the presentation, but this is my friend, Elena Jordan. She works at Universal Studios, so she's hanging out there with ET um, on their sets. But uh, so I like that picture of Elena and ET because what I'm trying to focus in on today is what happens inside our minds. This is a lot about imagination and how imagination is really good for us. And I guess one of the uh, major premises I'm working from here is that TV gets a bad rap a lot of times. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that you can't be a media hater or a media lover. Um, you know, I've done some past work in media violence, and so people have assumed that I hate all media or that I hate all video games. And that's, I think, kind of insanity. I don't. I love video games. That's why I chose to do my dissertation on them. But no, um, you know, medium is just a channel of communication, so it would be kind of silly or reductionistic to say the least to say that they're all good or they're all bad they're, they're channels for messages so they could be anything or you know anything literally so um i have a quote here from george gardner talking about um how we don't always remember that a lot of what we know about through a kind of experience is not something that we've actually done i've never been to spain random example but I think I know something about Spain. I've seen um, a lot of films uh, that have been made there. I've read a lot about it. It's not the same as it being there, but um, you know, I've never seen an alien either, speaking of Elena and E.T., but I have in my imagination. And imagination is really powerful. Um, some of you may be familiar with a lot of psychology work that shows that just imagining something can actually make us better at that thing. Even things like sports, like imagining if you're a basketball player taking shots, you actually get better at doing it. So that's what I'm talking about here, that stories such as television and film are imaginal. They're um, simulators. Different people use different language for that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I also wanted to, to contextualize this in terms of scholarly fields. Uh, there was an article about Mad Men Unzipped last week, and the author said that we had said that nobody has studied fandom. And, you know, if you've ever been interviewed by a journalist, you know that just they always get tons of things wrong, not because they're bad, it just happens. But um, what we had actually said in the book was, psychology hasn't given, given nearly the focus to fandom as uh, the humanities has. So if you're interested in fandom, you know Henry Jenkins' name. Uh, he's not a psychologist, that's what I'm saying. Um, we, we have different perspectives that we can bring to this. Some people are sociologists, some people are literary scholars. Uh, my husband's a, um, a theater person. So all kinds of different um, scholarly areas can contribute to an understanding of fandom. But it's interesting to me that psychology um, hasn't contributed as much literature as the people in the humanities. Um, so Henry Jenkins is an example. Here's his book, um, one of the classics, Textual Poachers, and I love that. Um, I'm a Star Trek fan, so I love that image of uh, Data and uh, uh, the Doctor and all those people from Star Trek in um, one of the episodes. Um, I just mentioned Katherine Larson, who's the editor of the Journal of Fandom Studies, and I want to give a shout out to her because a lot of the material in there was, um, has been uh, published from the humanities perspective, which is great, but the shout out is a thank you for her publishing our work in there from a psychological perspective, and that is in the, um, in the description of the journal that it's multidisciplinary, including psychology and these kinds of um, ways of looking at uh, fandom. So. Uh, but a lot of fandom studies then, just as an example, is textual analysis. So I might, uh, the text of Star Trek, since we have a photo of Star Trek here, is, for example, this episode. I could analyze the text of what happens in there and talk about that. You know, a psychologist, we do different things, but even me as a social psychologist, my job is to look at the individual and what's happening inside my mind, my emotions, my thoughts. I mean, cognitive can be um, affective, can be behavioral. Um, but, you know, psychology is about the person, what's inside the person, and so how we change, grow, develop through our connection to fandom. Um, Mad Men, the conference, um, is an example. There's, we've done a lot of work on Mad Men, and so there's an upcoming conference, which sounds great, about Mad Men. 
And here are just some of the topics that the conference organizers have posted. Narrative structure, symbolism, music, and sets in Mad Men. And I just choose those. They're all great and interesting. I'm just saying they're, they tend to be from a different perspective than a psychological perspective. They're textual, um, symbolic, structure. Um, the Pop Culture Association, which a group of us have been going to for the last few years. Um, um, it's exciting for me in part because it, there are so many non-psychologists there. Um, and for, just as an example of a talk, um, I think Jerry Lynn and I might have gone to this talk together. Um, it was a talk about uh, attitudes towards technologies as they were emerging in the television show Downton Abbey. So again, the, the text of Downton Abbey. Uh, we saw another one about um, anti-hero and the hero and the father-son relationships in the text of Breaking Bad at Pop Culture Association. So it's not that nobody's studying fandom or nobody's doing it well. Um, it's just that psychology has a great opportunity to, to study it more. And uh, this is a little small, I apologize. This is a table from um, the second edition of How Fantasy Becomes Reality. This just gives you an idea. Um, Vulture.com uh, a few years ago came out with this table of what they considered the top 25 fan bases. And so you can see just by looking across these that some of these are story worlds and some of them are other types of things. So like Lady Gaga is on there. Uh, Oprah is on there, but Game of Thrones made the top of their list. You know, there are different lists and people use different criteria. I've, I've mentioned that they included fan fervor in their criteria, but we've got Star Wars, Harry Potter, Star Trek, Doctor Who, um, some of the ones that you probably would think of if you were thinking about really ardent fandoms. So again, one thing about a sociological approach to fandom is that it tends to focus on externals. So, um, for example, what fans do behaviorally, things like cosplay, um, going to conferences, lots of behavioral things that fans do. And there's, there's certainly avenues for psychological investigation of those things, and they're very interesting, and, and my colleagues and I have studied some of those. But as a social psychologist, I find myself tending to veer towards what I call um, in fantasy um, internal fandom. By internal, I mean it's like, you know what they used to call the black box of uh, psychology, the stimulus, the black box, and the response, like in the old days of behaviorism. But what's inside the black box? So what's inside my mind? I'm thinking about things. I'm thinking about ideas, about beliefs, about values about feelings, I'm experiencing emotions and opinions, and these things are evoked by, I'm gonna call it the fan object, it's often called that in the literature, so fan object it might be Star Trek, it might be a particular episode of Mad Men. So my, one of my bigger interests is, in the, in the research I'm gonna be talking about, is how we make meaning from fandom, how we understand our beliefs, how we develop ideas, and this is not a passive sort of hypodermic model of media. It is a, an interactive, interactive one. And I think it's really exciting. So um, this literature, I think, really has its roots in one of, the, one of the strong areas that we have contributed, which does apply to fandom. It doesn't apply to fandom in terms of cosplay and the externals and things like that, but it, it does in, apply to the internals. And that's the literature's on identification, uh, character identification, and in transportation. If you're not familiar with those terms, um, transportation, I have a definition here, quick one from Green and Brock. Getting lost in a story world, transportation is close to other terms like engagement. Um, it's even close to Csikszentmihalyi's term flow, which is when you're very into something, your mind has gone there. And so uh, people like Melanie Green, she's the, the most, um, the one who's most associated with transportation theory. She and her mentor, Timothy Brock, um, uh, came up with that paper in 2000. Um, also, lots of people have done work on different kinds of identification. Now, when I say I identify with a character, it's a term that writers use, and it's a term I think lay people use, but it's been defined in lots of different ways, and people have, been a bit frustrated sometimes because there are such different ways. 
The one that I find the least helpful is when um, we talk about identification as being that a character is like me demographically, um, you know, white, female, that sort of thing, because why it's frustrating to me is because, of course, one of the great things about being attached to an object of your affection, your fan object, a fan world that you love, is that those people can be so different. I mean, they can be aliens, they can be all kinds of different races, and they could be you know, animals, they could be lots of things. They don't have to be demographically like you. We're connecting to something that we find elemental about them that we can relate to. They're relatable. Um, so here are some different definitions of identification from the literature. Liking could be saying that I identify with someone. Um, my husband teaches people how to write screenplays and sometimes he gets frustrated because he says, he reads someone's play and he thinks, why should I care about these people because they're awful? So one of the premises is you need to make somebody who's likable or you're not going to be able to connect with them. That doesn't mean perfect or great or always good or even morally um, wonderful, but something in them. We're going to talk about Mad Men research. Don Draper, lots of people have different opinions about him. I'm going to share some fan opinions about Don Draper, the, one of the protagonists from the show Mad Men. Um, there were times myself as a fan watching that show where I just wished he would get it together and I just wondered if there was really goodness inside of him. But I'm relating to him as a person, even though I do know he's a character. I know he's in, played by an actor. But so here's some, just some different kinds of um, identification, including feeling empathy towards someone, um, imagining that we're in that world, wishing that we were more like Buffy, uh, the vampire slayer, or some, or some character. Um, one reason that psychologists focus on transportation and identification is that because we really are so based in effects research, we like to look at the effects of things, and so we look at things like narrative persuasion, which means, can I change your mind about something? Um, because you've seen a story. Like, are you going to become more environmentally active? Like you've seen Avatar or something like that. So I talk about some different metaphors for narrative engagement. And um, I have this image here because this is actually often the kind of thing I'm sitting around thinking about. I'm thinking about what's going on behind this young lady's eyes as she's watching the screen. What's going on behind your eyes, my eyes, everyone, as we're hooked into a film that we love. Um, and by the way, it can be video games, it can be lots of things, a story world, whatever that is. So um, I, I kind of try to look for different metaphors here. What's going on? I think not just one thing is going on psychologically. So I talk about James Cameron's Avatar, the film, as a kind of metaphor for narrative engagement or transportation that we're linked to another person an alien in this case, an avatar, like in the sense that you use it in Hindu mythology, the avatars and James Cameron's avatar are actually blue, like uh, in Hindu art. Um, avatars as in Jeremy Balenson and um, Jim Blaskovich's work at the Virtual Human Interaction Laboratory. There's a, a person, a um, personified image on the screen that, that you're controlling. Um, of course, you're not controlling them in um, traditional media like television and film. In that film, Avatar, I talk about the bond, um, meaning the connection between watcher and actor as being a, a metaphor for narrative engagement. And so in, in Balenson and Blaskovich and their colleagues' work, they find the Proteus effect, which is that when you have that Avatar experience, you tend to mimic what that Avatar has done. So they're doing it in the virtual human interaction laboratory, but we're doing it in a way, in a different way, um, when we hook into a film or a television show. If I, if I feel as though I am feeling that person's emotions, then in a sense that is me. And a lot of this is about extension of self. For a social psychologist, where that line is between the self and the other, I think that's a very dynamic and it's a big area that we could study so much more. And this is kind of a side note here. I'm fascinated by what's been called the avatar effect by some people, which is that after seeing James Cameron's Avatar, some people were very depressed and even suicidal, according to reports, because they loved that world. Um, and they, of course, couldn't inhabit that world. And so I cite that because, um, you know, I can understand that. I can empathize with that. I love that film, too. And that world seems so engaging. And 
uh, I think you'll end up wishing your world could have some of those characteristics. So the social psych of internal fandom has to do with several things. It has to do with empathy, emotional and cognitive. Some people call it merging, like Agartua and Barrios. Um, perspective taking. Kaufman and Libby have a wonderful paper, which I really love, where they talk about um, the self-other distinction in hooking into a story. Their work is on written narrative, but it, it applies here. Um, Scannell talks about the where and the when we are when we're hooked into a story world. He calls it doubled spatiality and doubled temporality. So I'm in the room, I'm watching the screen, but I'm also there. I'm in my current time, but I'm also in that time. Uh, here's a quote from a theater um, uh, researcher who talks about how when you watch uh, a dramatic narrative, you are reconceptualizing um, problems in your own life and figuring out a way to solve them yourself. So one of the big messages that I would want to portray here is that I think that when people say, oh, you're watching TV, that's a shameful waste of time, you're a couch potato, they're missing that, yes, there's a lot of just for fun media that's, you know, maybe it's time killer, just pleasant, and there's a lot of pleasant, but there's a lot of it that's actually really intimate, really personal, doing something for us, and I'll talk a little bit about what I think that might be as we go along here. Um, Vorder, Steen, and Chan, and also I'll talk about Keith O. Work, they, they all talk about entertainment and the entertainment interface between person and entertainment object as a simulation. I think that's a great word for it, that you're simulating life, you're simulating experiences, and it's creating the subjective experience of relationships. Now, one of the areas that psychologists have tended to study in this um, big domain is celebrity worship and um, uh, why am I blanking on the term? Uh, when you, oh, if Cynthia were here, she would tell me what this word is. It's, it'll come to me shortly, but it's, um, it's the idea that you're a little bit nutty because you think that you know people who are on the screen, that you have a personal relationship with them. Um, and I would say that's, um, that's not really being respectful of what the, the social processes, you know, our brains were made to be adaptive and to um, have social encounters with people who we see face to face. We didn't know when this structure was created that we were gonna see people on screens. And um, we have these intimate relationships with them. So it's, it's not uh, a fault that we're connected with those people. Um, I don't think that it, it should get the kind of pejorative um, descriptions that it sometimes gets. So Anne Barsh and Mary Beth Oliver and their colleagues have done uh, some phenomenal work that I think is truly foundational to this whole area. They started with questions like, why do we cry at sad movies? And how come we say we enjoy sad movies? Do we enjoy Platoon and Schindler's List? They're not fun. Um, they're not hedonic, that's the term they give to it. They're not fun. But they're eudaimonic, which means um, Entertainment, which is thought-provoking, what we would call good films, um, worthy films, things that evoke um, mixed emotions, but that we feel like we're better off from having seen those things. We feel like we're better off as a person from having seen Schindler's List, like their importance. So, for example, Oliver and Hartman wrote that uh, meaningful movies helped viewers reflect on the value and fleetingness of life, the importance of human virtue and endurance, and the inevitability of sadness, cruelty, and pain as part of the human condition. Um, in some of my other work, I do research on um, self-compassion meditation, and um, that reminds me a lot of what uh, Kristen Neff calls common humanity in self-compassion, that I can see that we all experience a common humanity, that life it has pain in it, life has suffering in it like the Buddhist philosophy. And so in that sense, we feel like this was a good idea for me to spend time with this movie. So what do we know about how fiction works? Again, the internal parts of fandom. And I should pause here to say why fandom? A lot of most of this research that I've been talking about so far hasn't used fans. They've used just people, which is fine. 
But the thing about a fan is a fan is an enthusiast. And so who better to know each of those characters intimately, to know the storyline, to know the place. Um, it's so much richer, I think, if you can take all of that research, like transportation, identification, um, eudaimonic and hedonic um, you know, motivations for uh, uses and gratifications for media, and use fans, use enthusiasts. And so we have done that in some different ways here uh, in the work I'll talk about. So what is it about fiction that works for us psychologically? It, it builds our well-being. It makes us better creatures. And as a social psychologist, I'd say as social creatures, a lot of what we're interested in here is sociality. So why? Well, fiction is more coherent and understandable than real life. In real life, people don't have a beautiful script. We mumble. We don't know what we're talking about. We make mistakes. We, um, we're, we're not pointed, a camera isn't pointed at us to say the perfect thing about exactly what we really mean. So it's more coherent. It's more understandable. It, it triggers our own emotions and helps us explore our own personal truths. It triggers our own autobiographical memories. So again, that self-other continuum, psychologically, inside my head, what's happening if I'm hooked into, say, Mad Men, and I'm thinking about Peggy, one of the main characters, who is a woman um, in the working world of the 60s who experienced sexism but was really talented and made her way up um, in her job. So maybe that triggers some autobiographical memories in me. And so I am processing my own emotions, feelings, thoughts, beliefs, as I connect with Peggy, part of me feels that I am Peggy, that I've been there. I haven't been there in the 60s. I haven't been an ad executive, but in my mind, I have in a lot of ways because I've seen the entire show of Mad Men. Um, so lots of the, the, these research studies here that I'm citing, they, they look at autobiographical memories that are evoked from narrative fiction. And so um, Oatley uh, specifically talks about how our emotions can be processed via fiction because our own life experiences can get out of the way. It can be more distilled, more the volume can be turned up on it. We can understand um, what's important to us in life, what lessons we need to learn, how we can change. If I'm watching Don Draper and I'm frustrated with him, I might say, how am I like him sometimes? How can I change? How could I be like the good parts of him? How could I be like Peggy? What mistakes is she making that maybe I have made? And so when you're sitting on a couch watching TV and people call you a couch potato, I think it really makes a difference what you're watching. And we spend so much time as parents saying, like, I can remember from my childhood, don't look at the boob tube and you know, things like that. Well, what are you watching? Can you have a conversation um, with your child? My son Jason is here and I remember he watched the last episode of Mad Men to me, in which I was crying and everything else. And, you know, it's special to be able to share those kinds of things. It's not just time kill, you know. So I've gone on record here with my son saying it's not time kill. Um, so we use fantasy to better understand reality. Um, my book uh, that just came out in the second edition is called How Fantasy Becomes Reality. And I meant that in lots of different ways. And one of the ways that I'm exploring that now is that imagination is crucial to understanding life. And we can't be everywhere, we can't be everyone, but we can have so many experiences through books and film and television. And so we engage in, um, in meaning making and gaining insights. Now I see uh, by the plaque here that I'm actually at 12.30, so I have some more studies I was going to talk about. Should I, should I pause here? Should I go ahead and oh, finish them up? Karen, this is Jerry Lynn. Please keep going. The idea was 30, 40 minutes approximate. Please give us your whole presentation and then we'll have a conversation afterwards. That's fine. Okay. Thank no you so much. I, I hate to yet. <laughs> okay, great. We're all enjoying. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, you know, I've talked about how we gain things from that experience. I'm really like shy about using the word learning. I think it is learning, but it's interactive learning. I don't mean it again in a hypodermic way where I sit down and I watch a show that's against racism and I'm not racist now. It's, it, it doesn't ignore the person. The person brings their own psychological um, strength to that relationship. So it is learning, but I'm a little shy, like I say, about using the word learning, and I'd be really interested in what you think about that. It's not that we're getting a carbon copy of the ideas we see. We're 
more engaged learner in that situation. So uh, I want to talk about a paper um, that uh, my colleagues and I, uh, whose names are listed here, have done um, recently in the Journal of Fandom Studies. And here's a way that we tried to amplify fan voices. One of the most exciting things to me about a social as a social psychologist about social media is that people's voices are out there. They're out there for us to just listen to. And you know, when you do traditional experimental work, you have to bring people into the laboratory. They're often a convenient sample. So maybe they're 18 year olds, maybe they've seen Mad Men, maybe they've not. They're, they're probably college students, a lot of them, um, the traditional college sophomore, and, and that's fine. But you know, nowadays with social media, we have people just sharing their opinions. So we were able to get some pretty intimate, I think, um, explorations of how fans are grappling with their own life and their own understanding of reality and their own values through this particular narrative. So as I've alluded to, Mad Men um, talks about the lives of Don Draper and Betty Draper who are pictured here. And uh, Don is an ad executive in the 60s in New York City and his colleague Peggy is a young woman who's um, trying to sort of, he's her mentor in, in the workplace and, and many other characters. But so this, it was on my list of top 25 fandoms. It's, it's an ardent fandom. And so that's one of the reasons my colleagues and I chose that. So we did a number of things, but one of those was a, um, a content analysis, sort of a traditional one um, supported by technology. We used deduce, which I think is a great tool for content analysis. And we found that of all of these comments, which there were hundreds that we looked at, um, one of the main things that fans did was uh, evaluate characters. Are they a good person? Are they not a good person? Are they a good parent? Um, how are they in their relationships? Do you like them, dislike them? How do they compare to other people? But you can see there's a number of things on there that gets people talking. It gets people talking about gender roles, about sexism. There's a theme of sexism, a theme of racism in Mad Men and I think that it's um, an argument against those two things, but on the surface, it can seem like maybe they're pro-racism and sexism. I don't think they are. Um, it gets people talking about generational cycles, how things are now and how they were then, and it gets people picturing themselves in those situations. Again, these people didn't know they were in a research study. We called their comments from online, so they weren't talking to psychologists. They were just talking to the world. These were public comments. Um, and these are some, we're diving down into the, the data a little bit more. Um, in Deduce, they're called parent codes and child codes. They're the, the grand code and then the subsidiary. Well, the child codes, the most common ones, and you can see the number of times they appeared here, uh, were condemning Don Draper, condemning Betty, and then defending Betty, condemning Betty as a mother, um, defending Betty as a mother. So you can see um, the different things that were going on there, um, talking about their interactions with their kids, thinking about life in the 60s. And uh, in this chart, we're looking at um, what's the sum total of this fan view of Don and Betty Draper. So they're two of the main characters throughout the show. Um, uh, and so you can see that for Don, what's that giant green column? Condemning him as a person. <laughs> they're saying Don Draper is a bad person. What's the um, uh, littlest one? Defending him as a parent. Okay, so um, Betty, her, her chart looks a little bit different. We are defending her as actually a person. That's nice to see. Um, talking about sexism, is there sexism or not in Mad Men? According to these fans, and they didn't, of course, say it like a psychologist would, I condemn Betty as a person. They said, you know, they, they talked about her and where, where she was coming from. Was her heart in a good place? Is she bad? Is she just a bad person? Um, and so, like, what kind of spouses are they? What kind of people are they? What kind of parents are they? And you can see. So these are, these are views. And I point out the, the, the fact that we talk about these characters. They talk about these characters as people. Again, it's not because they're out of touch with reality and none of us realize they're not characters. It's because there's truth in fiction. So we're talking about them as if they were real people because real people do things like um, they do. It's amplified, it's distilled, it's made in Hollywood, but still there's some reality under that. Uh, Cynthia Vinnie and I did a paper that's coming out soon in the uh, psych of popular media and culture um, where we analyzed Mad Men fan fiction from um, the perspective of some of the work of Mary Beth Oliver and Anne Barsh, where we're um, talking about the components that 
um, fans who write fan fiction are putting in their works. And so, again, these are stories that people who love that story world are generating. And so they don't know they're, they're being analyzed by psychologists, poor people. But um, they're, they're expressing their feelings and they're expressing their creativity and ideas. And so we gather these uh, fanfic stories from archive of our own, also known as AO3, and from fanfic.net, two of the biggies in fanfic. And we had 337 stories, and we did a um, uh, analysis with Lexamancer, which, which is a lexical analysis. And from that, we found out a few things, such as most of the stories, the top character that the stories were about was Peggy. So even though I've been saying Down and Betty, the show's about Down and Betty, you could really argue it's about the whole core cast, and you could argue also that it's just a story about Peggy. Sometimes I feel like it is. Um, but we like Peggy. Most people like Peggy. They have some trouble with some of the things she does. But here, if you can see, um, we have a chart here on the paper where we talk about the eudaimonic components. Um, fan fiction, this particular fan fiction was more eudaimonic than hedonic. So there was some fun, there was a little bit of humor, not nearly as much. This is a drama, so uh, it's not just we walk back and jokes left and right. There's some humor in it, but um, a lot of it was reflection. It was very thoughtful. It was elaborating. Uh, some of it was what ifs. Some of it was um, wish fulfillment, meaning there were stories about, if you're familiar with the show, Peggy and Ted were a couple at one point on the show, and then um, they drifted apart. Peggy and Stan, I won't. If you haven't seen the end of the show, maybe I shouldn't ruin it for you. I hate when people ruin shows for me. But anyway, um, some of this stuff hadn't, um, hadn't been fulfilled on the show, but was being fulfilled in these stories. So you could call some of it wish fulfillment, but more of it was this reflective, thoughtful, um, thinking through, meaning making, elaborating on the stories. And so some of them um, explored what is important in life, um, like we were talking about with what, what does eudaimonic mean? Well, it evokes mixed emotions and it talks about um, what's valuable, what's important, um, even the meaning of life. And some of them even talked about how the characters explore what the meaning of life is. We coded um, various emotions. You can see that there were um, a lot of sad points, a lot of angst. Um, fan fiction has a kind of a emphasis on angsty scenes. There were some angsty scenes. There were about 30% of them were explicit sex scenes. I mentioned that because sometimes people think fanfic is like 100% sex scenes, and it's not. Um, a lot of sex scenes were angsty sex scenes. Frankly, I don't want to read any of those sex scenes ever again because they're very angsty. But um, it's just showing you that people are taking this seriously in terms of their own growth and development and their own creativity. So I think it's a, a way of bringing to light what uh, Oliver and Barsh and colleagues and what Keith Oatley and some of these others I've been talking about have, have done. That, um, it's a way of working out our own feelings through a fandom. So um, fan fiction authors were thinking aloud about Mad Men. 90% of them took the perspective of the character. They weren't sort of artistic or they were just talking in general. They were mostly talking through Peggy or they were Peggy, Ted, Peggy, Stan, um, sort of combinations. Um, and so my conclusions from all of this is that watching these kinds of stories that evoke eudaimonic motivations, that evoke um, careful thinking and analysis, grappling with what's important in life, what's the meaning of life, how do we treat each other? What are the nature of our social relationships? Should we get together with this kind of person or that kind of person? What makes a good parent? What makes a good relationship? What's the right thing to do in a situation? That's a bunch of social simulation. It's social processing. Um, there's a book called Social, um, Matthew Lieberman wrote. And in it, he said, when we are not doing something else explicitly, our brain defaults to a processing network that processes social information. And I think, Media like this is a way which, in which we do that too. He says we need to be social experts because it's adaptive. It's a life or death kind of a thing. And so we're always thinking social thoughts and we're always trying to learn, develop, grow, adapt. And I think TV and film fandom is adaptive in that way. So fans aren't crazy, we're smart. We're connecting to something that has value. And uh, there's a wealth of opportunities for psychologists who want to help unravel some of these mysteries because I think they are still mysterious and there's a lot to be unraveled there. And um, 
one of my big takeaways is we can find truth in fiction. Okay, I am finished. Um, Thank you, Karen. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open up for questions. If someone isn't able to actually um, uh, speak, then, um, then uh, we'll go ahead and put it in chat. And John, I see something that you have in chat. Is that for everyone? Well, actually, it was, a, it was a question for Karen, yeah. Okay, go ahead. You want to ask it or you want me to read it? I'm sorry, I said you hit the right button to see the chat. I apologize. Go ahead and, and ask it, John. If you would read it, Jerry, that would be fine. Okay. All right, so um, Baron Cohen's extreme male brain theory includes the idea that subjects exhibit an exaggerated male characteristic of perceiving others as thinking machines or objects rather than feeling human beings, but aren't characters in fiction actually true thinking machines or objects conjured up by writers and played out by actors? If they are, then isn't their purpose to represent ideas and act out a story that exists independent of the viewer? In this case, it seems to me sensible that fans might converse about plots and story developments, but discussing characters' thoughts and psyches pardon me, is pointless since they have none other than what are overtly expressed by their avatars on screen. What am I failing to grasp? Well, um, we're, we're starting out with an easy one for you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know John, I know how his mind works, a very complex, well, I won't say I know all the mysteries of John's mind. Yeah, call this a nasty, Call this an Aspie grapples with fiction. Yeah, no, I think that's fascinating. Um, so I actually think you're touching on some of those things that, I, that I'm calling mysterious. So one of those things, um, there's a whole area that I really didn't highlight here. There's an article about, um, I wish I had the author's the names in my mind right now, but there's an article about how we confuse the actor with the role. Now, is it a confusion? This is a, so you're talking about what's going on in the person's head. The person is like an avatar, right? So John Ham is like an avatar. So he may not be thinking any of those things. I think that process is still mysterious. I know that um, Ellie Kona has done some great work about, I know she has a background in theater, and she's done some great work on emotions um, in the audience and in the actors. Um, so is the actor the same as the role? Well, not, this, if there were a Venn diagram, they're not 100% the same. I'm thinking about Leonard Nimoy and um, how he wrote a book called I Am Not Spock, and then years later he wrote a book called I Am Spock. Is he or isn't he? Well, I think that's just one. You, you raise so many intriguing ideas, and I'm going to forget some of them, remind me of some of them that I'm missing here, but one of them is who are we watching? I think this is this is just my um, experience and my talking to to actors and to my husband who works in the theater world that um, especially for method actors and my apologies to actors because I don't know much about this I'm a psychologist so I'm just saying from what I understand it a method actor is trying to get into the person so speaking of Leonard Nimoy I understand that he used to go around um, seeming rather emotionless. If you don't know about Star Trek and Leonard Nemo, you probably do. I'm assuming you probably do, but you know, so the premise of that character was that um, there was a race, uh, an alien race, and they were trying to conquer their emotions. So to them, it was a compliment to say that they did not act on emotion. Um, and that's so different from human psychology, who's actually half human, but that's another story. Anyway, um, Leonard Nemo was trying to play a character without emotions. Um, I was involved with a, with a story, um, Elena Jordan here on the screen was an actress in a story that my um, husband wrote the screenplay for called Herlock, which was a, a vision of women as um, Sherlock Holmes and John Watson, those characters. And the actress, uh, the wonderful Gia Mora, who played the um, Sherlock Holmes character, was talking to Lee before filming about how do I play a character without emotions? You know, <sighs> facial feedback theory, Paul Ekman says that when we're expressing an emotion on our face, we're feeling it inside. 
I don't claim to be an expert on, on how that applies to people with Asperger's or uh, other or, um, people on the autism spectrum, but um, you know, people, um, neurotypical people attribute emotions. When someone's displaying an emotion, we attribute it to what they're feeling. Of course, there's acting. Some people say acting means fake, but method actors, they're experiencing those emotions. So I think, who knows if I'm right or wrong or how to, how to demonstrate this, I think that there's some of John Hamm and Don Draper. How, where do you draw the line? There's some of Leonard Nimoy and Spock. You know, after the show Mad Men went off the air, they announced that, that Don Draper, I was gonna call him Don Draper, that John Hamm went into rehab. I'm not saying he is Don Draper, I'm saying that the two are not orthogonal, the Venn diagrams cross. And so people make those attributions. We make attributions. I know when I'm watching Mad Men that Don Draper is played by John Hamm, and I know that John Hamm is an actor. My own personal experience, I saw John Hamm on, um, with John Stewart on an interview that was to do with the fact that he appeared as a voice in um, the Minion movie. And he was smiling. And I can't tell you how good I felt after seeing John Hamm smiling on um, John Stewart because I had watched him for eight seasons be morose, like almost never smile. And he, there he was smiling. So what does it do to you to spend all that time drinking, womanizing, you know, on the screen, all that? I don't know. Some of these are mysteries. Um, some of them are things that psychologists have been writing about forever, about how we attribute emotions to the actors that we're watching. I mean, you could talk about social psych and attribution theory. Am I misattributing something because that person is an actor and they're made to play a role, you know, they're playing it for their career. So, you know, yeah, they are playing it, but to an extent it's part of them as well. So I don't know where the line is, but I'm fascinated by just that topic. And then that's just talking about how a fan is supposed to make sense of who they're watching if this person exists and again the reality to me is the reality of a story like a written story that yes lord of the rings doesn't exist in real life um stephen colbert would be mad for me saying that but um it is a story world that many people love and imagine so so it's imaginal and you know, I can remember back to one of the first times I ever taught social psychology to undergraduates. And one of the key elements of social psychology is that it's all about perception. Nobody cares what some supposed factual reality is. What we care about is what we believe. We act on what we believe to be true. So where, where is reality anyway? I mean, some things are supposedly facts, but even this table that I'm sitting at I know that there's space between the atoms, even though it doesn't look like it, but I'm going to act like it's not. I'm going to set my coffee cup on it. You know, these are like large philosophical questions, I think. Um, I have a anything? question, Karen. Oh, sorry, when you're done. No, no, I'm done. Oh. Um, so uh, and when you're talking about like actors, both of my best friends are actors, and um, we've done Ren Fair for like ever, and um, Renaissance Fair, I guess I should specify. Um, and one of the things that we talk about because we're taking on the kind of trying to adopt these mentalities for these characters that we're playing all day long, is we're interacting with all these people as these characters. One of the things that we talk about is um, uh, fundamental attribution error because it's, you know, because um, a lot of times, like even as the actors in the Renaissance Fair, we'll assume like, we happen to be the bad guys in the Ren Fair, and um, my best friend was this very like kind of evil, mean character, and people s always assume that that is what he is like. So we have to talk about that. Um, is there like is that part of like what you guys study? And is there anything that you guys have done with? I know that you're doing like TV and stuff. Have you found anything like that? for theater specifically, or has have you like come across any research that has to do with theater? Yeah, well, so I did a study with uh, Lee, my husband, and Melanie Green, and Erica Starr, and uh, uh, one of the fielding students, Craig Federer, um, where I was doing it from the standpoint of learning about um, intimate partner violence through theater. So Lee wrote a play 
about the realities of intimate partner violence. And in that play, there were uh, couples, um, different races. Um, the perpetrator in one couple of the intimate partner violence was a female, and another couple that was a male. There was some physical, there was some psychological abuse. And um, after that, I did a number of things. One of the things was we had a talk back session with the um, audience of the play. Um, we asked them about, and this is part of the research, this is uh, published in the Journal of Health Communication. Ask them about their connection, their identification with those characters. And they really um, said that they identified with the people who weren't the victims and weren't the perpetrators. So it's like they wanted to just get way far away. There were two people in the play who weren't either. And they said they identified with those people, even though those sadly um, intimate partner violence is really common. And some of the statistics are running for women, but my point being that the audience felt that they wanted to distance themselves, I think, psychologically from the perpetrators and the victims, both of those were scary to them. Um, even though we could argue that they were the more interesting characters in the world about most of the action. I also interviewed the actors after this, and those are some data I haven't published, and I wanted to get into that and, and write it up. One of the things that I was fascinated by was the actor who played the male perpetrator of uh, emotional and physical abuse just was adamant that he didn't connect with the character, the character was not at all him, that um, he could have really identified with that person. Um, he just said some things that kind of blew my mind because I, uh, again, I'm not an actress, um, I just hang around them and watch them and all, but he was amazing in the war. I think he scared people in the audience even. But I don't know, it feels to me like you need to dig into that part of you that can at least understand it. And um, what you were asking me, Modi, reminds me of the classic social psych demonstration, Philip Zimbardo's um, Stanford Prison Study, which I know has been memorialized in film. But if you recall it, that um, demonstration, he um, got what he believed were healthy young men and he brought them into a, um, a set, basically, it was like a prison set in the basement of the Stanford University Psychology Building. And he assigned them randomly to either be prison guards or prisoners. And he locked the, the young men who were prisoners in that prison, let them leave. And it's a landmark study in social psychology. For some, it's very controversial for obvious reasons, but those discuss it. Those people were playing roles. That was about social roles. And they interviewed those people after the fact. And it really was like, it was like acting, but it was like nobody told them how to, to deal with it. They just said, you're the prison guards. You need to keep the, these prisoners in line. And there's some great interviews where they were talking about how they gave me the nightstick, they gave me the glasses, and I was that guard. And the, the people who were the prisoners and the people who were the guards had a conversation after that, and they tried to figure out those attributions. We were talking about the fundamental attributes where they were trying to figure out, are you really a decent human being, or are you that terrible prison guard who abused me in this situation? Do I now know what you're capable of? Do I know what we're all capable of? Those are questions that that study and the Milgram study, two of the biggest, um, most famous studies in social psych, what they delve into. So that that reminds me of that. You wouldn't call that acting, but it, you call it role playing. And well, one of my questions, again, I'm not an expert, is you know, what is acting? How do we perceive it? How does it take place in the mind of the, the actor as well as the audience? Uh, thank you, Karen. You, we are getting really close to the hour, so we have um, just a, a, can only take another question or two. I have to say the chat section is alive with um, a big discussion. I don't know whether um, Kristen or Cynthia might want to just capture it real quickly, um, and then we'll take one more question after that. So sorry, I'm not hitting the right button to see the chat, but does anyone have it's one? Too, it's they can too long for you to... Yeah, Karen, Car can't long for you to read right now, so don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Carlos asked a question specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the chat, and I, otherwise it was a discussion about um, one of the things that Karen was talking about earlier. So. 
so we'll just go straight to uh, Carlos. In, in, in your table, the most popular stories um, were of the hero type, Star Wars, Harry Potter. Why do you think these stories are the most popular? Because they are simple good versus evil with no gray areas, because people are trying to justify their own meaninglessness, existence, trying to achieve an ultimate goal. Um, why aren't more complex stories, which are much better represented, uh, representation of human nature, uh, more popular? Uh, that question just makes my spine tingle. I, I am so fascinated by that. I mean, we are all watching our own popular culture and we see these franchises. I have a friend who works in Hollywood and talks about how many franchises of like the Marvel Universe or different universes they have these films are planned out. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we are just fascinated by superheroes. Um, some of my colleagues and I have talked about doing studies that, that touch upon those elements. I don't know of one per se, although you could make the argument like Derek Greenwood has done work in Buffy. And there's lots of people. I think Sherlock Holmes is an intellectual superhero. I, I think Data from Star Trek is a superhero. Um, but yeah, so what is it about them? I wanted to study about that. I think, of course, that wish fulfillment thing where if they are our avatar, don't we want to be the one who can set everything right in real life? things happen and we don't get what we want all the time and we can't conquer every situation, but we wish we had the power. So maybe it's our own powerlessness, but maybe it's, maybe it's part of the hedonic parts of just fun that um, Jeremy Balenson did a presentation that I saw recently about his avatar research and he was talking about all the violence in video games. And he said that there was this, um, this uh, avatar game that was about superheroes where you can fly through the sky like Superman and you're, you're on a rescue mission to give some medicine to a, a sick child. And, you know, just thinking about how that would be a great hedonic and even eudaimonic in some sense um, fantasy. So yeah, what does that say about us that we have these sort of unending fantasies towards superheroes? And um, there was another thought I had about that. Um, well, Karen, you know what, we, write, uh, we are right at the hour. So I want to thank you again, because that was just a, a phenomenal presentation. We all enjoyed it. Obviously, the discussion could have continued on uh, for quite some more time. And we appreciate you uh, sharing your, your research and your expertise. So thank you. And thank you, everyone. My pleasure. My email is kshack at fielding.edu. And thanks, Jerry Lynn and my other colleagues who are on uh, the line for their wonderful contributions to this work. And thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Bye. Thank you for coming, Karen. Bye. My pleasure.